the first session will be about string views. Um, string view, QString view everywhere. And our presenter today is Mark Mutz. He's a long-term contributor to Qt. Uh, if you're ready, then please get going. Yeah. Hi, welcome from me too. Uh, I'll make this short. Uh, this is about me. For the purposes of this talk, I'm the author of QString view. <laughs> That's all you need to know. The rest you can Google. After the talk, please. So this is the program I have today. I actually seem to have to switch off my handy, because audio is bad. Um, so we'll talk about what QSpring is, how to use it, how to design APIs that use QSpring view, the uh, directions. And uh, then uh, one particular nice pattern is about uh, what is with the sound? Heterogeneous uh, associative container lookup. And then, if we have time, uh, we we'll go into several de technical dives about managing overloads, about contracts, and uh, actually, I don't have slides on const export. So, use string view. Documentation tells us that the QString view class provides a unified view on UTF-16 strings with a read-only subset of, Q -string, of the QString API. Unified view means that it's container agnostic. It does not depend on QString or std string or anything else or a character array. It completely hides those containers away for you. UTF-16 means it's like QString uses the UTF-16 encoding of Unicode. Um, other classes which use this is uh, standard U16 string, and on Windows only standard yeah. string. Read-only, of course, means it's readable, and that's by design. We don't want a view thing that you look at, not, not something that you touch. So just on that string view, the Q string view is read only. You cannot manipulate the, the characters underlying it. You can manipulate the Q string view. You can make a string, or you can uh, assign another string to it. But the characters underlying it are, un not, are not mutable. And it has Q string API. So there's always the question if you have something in the standard and if it's already released. Do you add that to Qt 2? And so far the... Hello, hello? Okay. Um, so the... Um, so so always the question is, um, will you add Whenever you're ready, so. Will you add it to Q, or will you tell people to use the standard facility? And so far, this has been always added to Q2. Uh, we have a nice Qt API. So, um, the recent months and years, it has it turned out that Qt is not so good keeping up with these things that the standard does. We have Q vector, it's inferior to standard vector. We hopefully will not get a stand, uh, Q optional. I think we shot that down in, in favor of standard optional. So um, all these small containers and um, vocabulary types, they are better suited to be from standard, even though they have a different API. Here. But here we're talking about Q string, and Q string is still light years ahead of standard string. I mean, the standard does not know Unicode. All the implementers say, I don't want all those huge Unicode tables in every program that uses text. And in Qt we have them. So it makes sense to provide something that's already in the standard, but with a Qt-specific angle here, indeed. So comparing QString with QStringView. QString is an owning container, whereas QStringView is non-owning. It's just a pointer and a, and a length. QStringView, when you construct one, it copies the data. 
Yes, it's implicit sharing, which does not copy the data, but just up the ref count. But in general, if you modify it later, it will detach and you will have two separate copies. String view just references the data. It never copies the data. Um, QString you can construct from a 8-bit literal. And QString you can't con be constructed from an 8-bit literal because it does not have storage to keep the result of the conversion from the 8-bit lit literal to the UTF-16 literal. QString functions mostly handle out of range. To a surprising degree, as we will see later. And QString we will just assert into your face if you access anything out of range, anything that does not make sense. QString data is usually null terminated. The only situation where this is not true is if you call QString colon colon from raw data with non-null terminated data. Then you can have a QString which has no, not a null at the end. But usually people assume that what you get back from QString data just as standard string data is null terminated. And QString view data usually isn't. As soon as you take a substring of something that was, it no longer is. QString view data also never returns null pointer anymore. It used to in Q2, maybe Q3. So there is a null QString state, but that does not mean that data will return null pointer. It will still return a pointer to an empty string. In QString view, uh, if data returns null pointer, the QString view is null, and that's an equivalence. This last piece is actually quite a problem for QString to QString view conversion, because on every conversion from QString to QString view, we need to check in the implementation whether the string is null and then put a null pointer into the QString view that's generated. Otherwise, just take dot data. I think there's a trend towards fixing this in Qt6, but nothing is still up in the air. So, let's have a look at uh, how you can use QString view. This is a QString function, as you would write them today. We have two helper functions, is valid first character and is valid follow-up character, which are just uh, checking whether the character that is given is a letter or underscore or a letter or number or underscore. And in is valid identifier, we eventually end up iterating over the remainder of the string. We need to handle the case where it's empty, that's here in line 7. We need to handle the first character separate because that must not be a, a number. Yeah. And then we go into the loop over is valid follow up character, which allows also um, numbers. And there's not, really, there's not really a nice way to do this with the QString API. I could write here, I could iterate over s dot mid one, but that would allocate, and I'm, I, why would I allocate just to iterate over something? So instead I take iterators at the beginning and the end, and since I already have them, I use them to check for emptiness and to advance uh, for the first character. So what we can do is we can simply replace the Q string. Oh, one thing. Um, here's a little test driver where we pass the argument that was given to us, if one was given. And that, of course, returns a Q string, a real allocated Q string. Or otherwise, uh, so we can run it more easily from uh, Qt Creator, we have this little piece here where we pass an 8-bit string literal. And this also works with QString, but it allocates. Hmm? Okay. So, one, two, three. So that allocates, right? 
And now, if we port to QString view, QString view can no longer accept 8 bit strings. So, if we make this change, as you can see, we change the definition of the function and the body stays the same. That's why we try to target QString API with QString view as much as possible, so you can just drop it in. And the other thing is that down there, we need to put a little U in front so that we get a car 16T literal, string literal, instead of a car literal. And that no longer allocates now, right? So that just converts to QString view, and without allocation, I can run is valid identifier, but it gets better. We can clean up the function now a bit. Oops. So first, we replace this it, uh, what, it equals end with is empty. Here. Oh, here. And instead of this uh, it star plus plus, we use s dot front. We're still an, uh, here with the loop, but I said we could rewrite the loop as a for loop over s mid one, but that was too expensive when we had a queue string. But now we have a queue string view. Uh, and here it's totally cheap. It's nothing, it's inline. It's, the compiler does not even see it. It's the same code that was there before. Now, it's telling us what it's doing. We don't need to pass all that iterator handling. But it, for the compiler, the code is the same, if not better. So, and um, since we have a queue string view and not a queue string anymore, we can go even one step further and make everything const expert. Q-string view is const expert um, to the greatest degree possible. Um, iteration is actually not. I'm lying a bit here. Iteration is not um, const expert because uh, the conversion from, a, from the underlying storage type, which is car 16t, uh, to Q-string, to Q-car, um, if you cast the pointers, and the iterators are just pointers, um, they, that is not allowed in a const expert function, reinterpret casting. So you can't write this, but you could write it manually. But this works without const expert. So why QString view? Why not do something else? We are C++ developers, so we want efficiency. So, as we have seen with mid, expressing high-level functions in, in, with QString is not cheap. We get hidden allocations, and most people actually don't realize that. Uh, we see that all, all over in customer code and in Qt itself. But if you have these high-level functions that, which are super cheap, as if you hard-coded them by hand, then you can use them even in high-performance code. And of course, you can say QString has a, has a ref counter design. Why can it not efficiently substring? Yes, why? Um, that's a design deficiency. It could be fixed. But there's also other optimizations that we want, might want to add to QString, like an SSO small string optimization. And there, we cannot have a fast substring operation. We, st we still need to move stuff around. And also remember that uh, QString data returns null, uh, returns a null terminated array pointer. And if you have an efficient substring operation where you have the block and you just point to something inside the block, uh, but still keep a, a strong reference on the block of memory, then you cannot guarantee that data still returns null, um, still returns a null terminated string. So the next uh, idea that you might have is we have this thing called QString ref. Why not use this? And we use it all the time. But QString ref has one problem. It's tied to QString. So you can construct a QString ref from a QString, and then you have efficient sub 
substringing and trimming and left and right. But um, if you don't come from a Q-string, you need to construct a Q-string first. So you cannot just take a car 16 literal like we did in the example and, and call a Q-string Q -string ref function. You need to construct a Q-string and that's what we want to avoid. We want to be independent of Q-string view, of Q-string. And there are also other technologies like Q-string view. I wanted to introduce this uh, cautiously into Qt5 to experiment. And Q-string ref is not a trivial type. We can make it a trivial type in Qt6, but for binary compatibility reasons in Qt5, it needs to stay a complex type. Um, it's also larger. So the next thing that you might ask is, so why not use that string view? And I already answered that partly, because QString is one of the few core classes which actually are better functionally than the std equivalent. Yeah? Um, because of Unicode normalization and all the Unicode tables that are in Qt. Um, so it makes sense to have a QString view. And something else comes on top. Because in Qt, we have QCar as a character type. In C++, we have car16t. And on Windows, we have, in addition, wcarT. They're all the same, two-byte characters, UTF-16 encoded. But you permanently need to cast from one to the other. When you go from uh, Windows API to QString, you need to cast. When you go from QString to Windows API, you need to cast, and so on. <clears throat> and with QString view, we want to match the efficiency of just pointer and length APIs. But if possible, surpass them in usability. So we want to be a better cons car star int. And one, one thing is apparent, apparent. This here does not accept a car 16 literal because there are two arguments and we need one. And here we can easily make the mistake of having some container like QVAR length array of QCAR and pass data of one of those and size of another one. Because there are two different arguments, we need to pass two different uh, expressions and therefore we can make mistakes. Um, this means that this kind of function always has a narrow contract. We will talk about that later. Um, but for now, uh, just, uh, just uh, remember that this kind of function always has a narrow contract. It has preconditions. This range needs to be valid. And if you take a QString view, you have a wide uh, contract. You have no preconditions. So QString view also gives us uh, no casting, as I said. Here we permanently need to cast to QCard star. And in addition to making mistakes, it's also hard to understand this API. What is, does the int do? In a lot of places, you can pass minus 1, and that means determine the length of the string yourself. What does it mean if you pass minus 4? Does it mean take the last four characters? This is part of the QString API that is used, um, this, this pattern. So what we want is something more expressive. And QString view is this, I think. And it was designed as an interface type. What is an interface type? An interface type is something that is used in interfaces, haha. <laughs> and I have come to the conclusion over the months of work on QStringView that owning containers should never be part of the API of a class. You should always accept views and copy the data in, and you should always hand out views to let people iterate over, over, your, over the contained elements. <clears throat> Because then you have great interoperability with everything, with C++, with Boost, with Qt, vice versa. 
And if you commit to one particular container, Q vector or Q list, you have tied the user, not yourself, but the user of your API to that particular container. And if we can reach this somewhere by Q7, that we do not have owning containers in the API anymore, then we can also start thinking about dropping our containers in, in favor of the Qt ones, or of the standard ones. And then all this call for, but we need copy on write semantics because we need to return containers and we need to pass them, all goes away because we don't need to do this anymore. So, how to use QStringView? How to construct one? You can construct a QStringView from the following things. A car string literal. I explain in a minute what that cursive car stands for. There's a little caveat here. Because we want to have a const expr QString view, and Microsoft, the Microsoft compiler is a bit behind on this, um, we try to make everything C11 const expr and not, if possible, not uh, only C14 const expr. And uh, one of the things that you can do with, if you pass the QCar literal, you can at compile time determine the size and just store that. So you get a car 15 array, you store 14 as the size, and then the pointer to the array as your data member. And the caveat here is that this constructor always assumes that you have a null terminated string literal, because that's the usual use case. If you don't, you can use another uh, constructor and pass begin, standard begin, standard end of your array to this constructor. You can also construct from a null terminated car star, and this is also const expert, but only in C14. That's why we split that out into another constructor. You can construct it from a car star and a size. You can construct it from a Q string, but just a Q string. We will later talk about how we manage the overload set between Q, Q string view and Q string to be able to overload the two. Um, and it turns out that you cannot just accept a string, anything that is uh, convertible to a Q string, but you need to accept just Q string. Same for Q string ref. Um, standard basic string of fitting characters. Basic string view we would like to add, but the compilers make it a bit hard to detect the presence without configure checks. Um, because the standardized way, SD6 uh, document that says uh, here are macros to use for checking for C++ features, they don't work in, in GCC in particular. So um, that is not implemented yet, but it's surely to come. We also have not done QVector because we have a cyclic dependency between QStringView and QVector. And we have not done standard vector because uh, we have no use, no use for it yet. The same goes for QVAR length array, but these are easy to add afterwards. And null pointer, of course. And what does this car star stand for? Car can be any character type in this list. Q car, U short, car 16T, or on Windows only, W car T. So all these constructors work with all these character types. So what are the salient functions? of the class. We have data and UTF-16. The difference is that data returns const car stars, and UTF-16 returns the storage type star, which usually is car 16 t but on Windows, on older Windows platforms, it's w car t because they don't yet have car 16 t We have size and length. There's also a small difference. Size returns a 64-bit value, a QS size t which was invented just for QString view. And length returns an int for compatibility with, um, with QString APIs. And uh, length asserts that the length is actually representable by an int. So if you have to interface with legacy code, you use in, uh, length, and then you get an assertion in debug mode if the length actually exceeds int max. Or int max divided by two, I don't remember. 
We have iterators, begin and end. Those sadly cannot be const expert because they return const car stars, uh, const q car stars, um, and the, the, the um, casting from car 16t star to car q car star uh, is not const expert. We have an add and an uh, indexing operator. Those are const expert. So if you need to loop in a const expert function, you can do it over UTF-16 and with indexing. We have starts with and ends with. We have front and back, left, right, and min, mid. We have chopped, chopped, truncate, trim, and trimmed. And as you can see here, chopped, I don't know that from QString. This is because it also was added. We have realized that um, for some functions we used a so-called action that performs the um, operation in line on the data in the QString. And for others we used an, a transformation which returns a copy. So chop is in line, it's an action. Chopped is a transformation because it returns a copy. And it makes sense to let the user choose what is most efficient for his use case. Um, so we are trying to add, even to QString, um, every operation in an action and a transformation form. We have Q to QString, and that obtains a strong reference to the data by copying it into a QString. And unlike QString ref, which knows which QString it was constructed from, it cannot return you a shared copy. If you take a QString ref of a QString and don't substring it and then ask it to return a QString, you will get a QString that is shared, implicitly shared, with the original. And since we don't store a pointer to a QString here, we just point at characters, we cannot do this. But it's overrated anyway. We also have the two Latin one and so on functions. And we have the full set of relational operators and hashing too. The target for 5.11 is to complete this so that we have everything reasonable from a const QString. So all the IAPI that you can call on a const QString should apply within reason um, to QString view 2. And what does it mean within reason? There are some things that we intentionally did not support. Mutating functions, I already said. Um, split will be replaced by a QString tokenizer. We'll talk about that later. And number will also get another API, basically because those things are allocating and we want something that does not allocate. Me, personally, I also don't like magic. And what do I mean with magic? I mean this. You all know QString mid takes a position and a number and uh, it returns the substring starting at position pause and n characters uh, following that. The problem is, what happens if you call this out of contract, or is there even a contract? And if you read uh, the documentation, it says, returns a null string if the position index exceeds the length of the string. Okay, why? Well, okay. Uh, it does not say what happens for pos uh, smaller than zero. If there are less than n characters available in a string starting at a given position, or if n is minus 1, the default, the function returns all characters that are available from the specified position. Again, what happens if n is smaller than minus 1? Not said. So it looks that we have a wide contract here, but it's undocumented. We seem to have no precondition. It always returns something defined but not all of it is documented. So we have to look at the documentation to find, to implementation to find out what it's actually doing for these things. And I gave up when I looked at this. This is slightly edited for brevity, only slightly. Um, it's so complex that it's in a helper function. And um, I want to point you to this part of the slide where I've counted the number of branches that you have to take just to calculate the substring. Yeah. We start with one branch and end up with uh, five to six branches. And this returns a cut result, which is an enum. So you have, when you call this function, you get an outer switch around it. So you have another jump. So you have up to seven jumps. And actually, the subsetting down there in line 21, that's 
the only time that the subset actually appears, and that's the usual thing why you call mid, and that is actually five to six, add one more for the switch, six to seven branches away. And if one thing you can know for sure, modern processes don't like branches. So, the other one is, um, so such is the cost of accommodating APIs that try to catch all the errors. So is this API easy to use? No. It, is it hard to abuse? No. It's easy to abuse. So, and why is that? Because I think it's because there are actually two operations that are folded into one here. And so I separated them in QStringView. There's a mid with just one parameter and gives from that position the rest of the string. And the other one is give me from that position that num number of strings. So anyone want to guess what the implementation of these functions is? One page, half a page. Who's for one page? Who's for half a page? Quarter page? It's a one-liner. Of course, this is what you get in release mode. In debug mode, we assert that pause is smaller than uh, smaller or equal, uh, smaller than size, and that uh, n is smaller or equal uh, than size minus pause. Blah blah blah. This function has a narrow contract. It will complain loudly and in debug mode if you call it out of contract. It will not return you some magic values. But in return, you get no branches. There are no branches here. Not seven, six or seven, there are no branches. All is in line, the compiler can see what you're doing. It's totally efficient as if you would be iterating over it. So QStringView as an interface type. A QStringView has this problem that it does not own the data. So, but if we pass something to a function, and that function does not store it, it just operates on the QString, you don't care. So this is the sweet spot for QString view. This is what it was designed for. We don't have lifetime problems. We have a very accommodating interface in the good sense, in that it, you can pass it anything that QString view can accept, and that is a lot, um, without allocation, and it will just iterate over it. As a return type, this is also a good pattern. Um, QString view here shines too, but callers need to be a bit more careful about what they do with the return type. And uh, the author of the function needs to be a bit more careful in documenting what, how long that QString view underlying data is valid. But this, for example, would solve the problem that we have currently where plugins use QString literal and return a reference outside into the main program, and then the plugin gets unloaded, and the, back, and the Q-string is no longer backed by the data because it has been unloaded. So, um, because when you want to store something from here, you need to take a copy. So this forces you to take a copy, a deep copy. This is problematic. This might be wrong. For example, if some func returns a unique Q-string, one that is not shared, you will reference data which in the next step will be deleted. So the solution here is to pin the, value, the return value to a temporary variable and then construct a QString view. You can say this is dangerous, but it's not. It's, whenever you take an iterator from a container, you have exactly the same problem. And even if you say, I'm a Java programmer, I don't dig this reference stuff, uh, an int index into a Java container can also get stale. It's an, if, as soon as you have some reference into some other container, and these are two separate, separate objects, they can go out of sync. It's not a problem, it's something that we deal with every single day. So here, the same thing, no problem. Count access takes a Q string view, some func can return anything, I get a compile error or nothing. If I don't get a compile error, this thing will work. Perfectly okay. So, how to use Q string view? Use it as a function argument without second thoughts. As a return argument, you need to document precisely how long the underlying data lives for the caller of your function. 
and as an automatic or member variable, watch out for lifetime issues. So, API patterns. This I call the legacy pattern. This is what we will find in Qt for quite some time to come. We had, we originally had a Qstring overload. Oops. And now, with the introduction of Qstring view, we want to add a Qstring view overload. And we can do this. And Qstring view is very carefully designed so that you can do this. I believe you cannot do this with stud string and stud string view, because certain calls would be ambiguous. So this is the pattern to use if you update legacy code. This keeps all existing calls, um, all existing calls intact. It does not break any existing calls, and it allows your users to pass all kinds of things in addition to queue strings. So, if you use this, you can let the queue string overload delegate to the queue string view overload to save some executable space. Setup pattern. Here we have the same. We overload queue string and queue string view, and they are never ambiguous. But we take the queue string as by value because the idea is that we store the queue string, and so we can move it into place. And uh, if we are getting a queue string view, we need to convert it to a string and then store it. So we take by value because that is the most efficient way uh, to have just one of those functions. You can, of course, also overload over const reference and uh, non-const uh, R value reference. But this is the one that I would suggest. And in this case, you can implement the string view one via the queue string one. But I would very much ask you to have the second function out of line, because then otherwise you litter the calling code with all those temporary queue string uh, calls and, um, and destructor calls. So if you have high performance code, like for example in QString itself, then you, need, you should provide these four overloads, QString view, const uh, QString, um, QCar, and QLatin1 string. If you provide a QLatin1 string overload, you need to guarantee that you actually do, on average, less memory allocations than if we would use the QString overload number four with a QLatin1 string as an, as an argument. I'm seriously out of time, but OK. So delegation. The QCar overload can just delegate to the string view one, as can the QString one. And QString view and QLatin1 string overloads are the ones that you need to implement. And you need to implement them separately. But this is mitigated by the fact that uh, as we develop QString view, we add the same functionality to QLatin1 string. So you just write a template function and then instantiate it once with a QString view and once with a QLatin1 string. And it will hopefully in the end work. Getters. Getters should return QString view. Yes, you always need to deep copy. No, it does not matter. If you actually measure and it matters for you that you do not partake in uh, implicit sharing here, then you add another getter that partakes in, um, in implicit sharing. But by default, this is what we should write. So some future directions. What is missing is mainly from the Qt 5.10 API is contains index of, and I already said that split we will not add, and the number to string and string to number conversion APIs we will also make new. So remember that in QString view, we want to avoid allocations. And now look at a potential split implementation using QString views. Something hits your eye here. QVector is there. And QVector is a dynamic container, and it allocates memory. So it allocates memory, it's not cache friendly because I need to split the whole string, collect all the results, and only then start iterating over, over the result set. 
solution for this is uh, to implement a queue string tokenizer. It's not in queued yet. A queue string tokenizer takes the same arguments as the queue string split function, but it constructs an object, and this object is iterable. You can iterate over it. And uh, so you can ask for parts. These parts, of course, will be queue string views into the original string, and then you can uh, trim the part and uh, compare it for whether they are x's, and so count the number of x's in a comma-separated list. The string tokenizer produces a new string view whenever you ask for it. It's like a generator. And uh, so you do not have to create all the substrings up front. You do not allocate memory here. Um, you tokenize and process at the same time. Number conversion API. So if you want to create a, Q uh, a number in car 16 t or Q string, uh, a Q character uh, array, you need to use this function. And this function returns a Q string and the Q string allocates. So what we propose instead is to have a formatted number, a template type that has an internal buffer which is large enough to hold the result. And if you have this, you can start playing with it. You can have an uh, implicit conversion to QString. You can have an implicit conversion to QStringView. You can even have an implicit conversion to QLatin1String or QBytearray. And then you do on-demand parsing or formatting into the same buffer. So the other direction QString to int. We have here an out parameter, this bool, star. Compilers don't like that. That's inefficient. But worse is that it leads to this ugly code when calling. Yeah. So you construct a bool. You don't know whether to init and if so, to what. Then you pass it and then you check the, bo the boolean to, in order to check whether you can use the R. But here's a hint for you. If you return something, Return it. So, do this. Standard expected is not, is not in the standard yet, but it's a proposal. It's basically a, a union between the T, in this case an int, and an error code. It's, not, it's a bit like optional, but not absent and, uh, and, and there, but absent or an error. So we have no out parameter here, and it's more efficient. We return more stuff. We always return the error, but it's still more efficient than the out parameter. And uh, I have seen some uh, Q result uh, floating around patches. I don't know the state of this. Um, I can understand why people want to use this, but again, um, I would, if we add this, I would do it in such a way that standard expected becomes a drop-in replacement with no other um, semantics, because otherwise we will be stuck with this Q result thing way past C20. So, with this new API, this is how you parse an int. You ask if R to R is to int, and if so, if that is true, you, you access star R, otherwise, you can ask R.error or something API. Another thing that I'm thinking about is. Um, doing something to Qbyte Array. So what is a Qbyte Array? The slide title kind of gives it away. It doubles as a UTF-8 string and a binary data container. So what does this function expect? We don't know. We don't know. We need to hope that the documentation tells us whether it expects a, um, a UTF-8 string or binary data. A partial, partial solution for this would be QUTF8 string view. I'm not sure whether we should call it QLet, QUTF8 string to mimic QLet in one string or whether we should call it QUTF8 string view to mimic QString view because it's both. It's like QLet in one string but for UTF8 characters. And it would have the following conversions. You could implicitly convert a QUTF8 string to a QString view but you would not be able to implicitly convert a cons caster or a qbyte array to, Q, to Q UTF 8 string. So, one nice pattern. 
heterogeneous uh, lookup. So the Qt containers lack heterogeneous uh, lookup. That means I can look up using a different type than the one that is stored. So that leads to the following. All this code is more or less valid, except that uh, QStringView does not implicitly convert to QString. So I can call find with a character literal, I can call find with a, a QString literal, I can call it with a QString. And uh, most of these will, will allocate. And the question here that I have for you is how many functions, find functions, have we just seen? Minimum one, maximum three. Who's for three? Two, one, it's one. Because it it's always takes a Q-string. Yeah. SDL containers have heterogeneous lookup. So if I use a standard map and I give it here this uh, diamond-shaped less operator, then I, can, then I have enabled heterogeneous lookup. So I can do this and it will uh, not create a Q-string, but it will compare what I give it to the Q-string. And I can give it a Q-string view, I can give it a Q-string literal, and I can give it another size of char. How many find functions have we done here? So minimum one, maximum four. Who's for four? Who's for three? Two, one. It's three or four, depending on how the implementation is, because that it turns find into a template function that accepts anything. And if I call it with a car three array in the first case, that might be different, that's an quality of implementation issue, whether that will call the same function as this one. Or because this is larger than the first, it will instantiate yet another function. So how many find functions, three or four. Can we do better? Yes, we can. So um, the first step is to um, put all the information into the contained type. In this case here, replacement, QString from and to. Next step is to do heterogeneous lookup by using QString view as the key type. So now we can pass everything to the find function that QString view accepts and it will never allocate. Quick question, how many find functions? One. So, and how do I put something into, a, into such a container? I have some parse entity here that returns me a name and a text. This is C++11, uh, C++17 syntax, but uh, you get the idea. Then I create a replacement from it by by creating strong reference because I'm storing something. I need to have Q strings or standard U16 strings or QVAR length arrays or what you want. And then I put these into the replacement array. So the first argument will implicitly convert to QString view and the second one I move into, into place. Why is this safe? That move there. Well, we only have three more minutes so I will. It's safe because the move happens inside the function and because QString if we use QString here, is implicitly shared. So the copy actually does not invalidate the, the data. As soon as a QString gets SSO, small string optimization, this will not work like this. It will work differently, but not as easy as this. And this is a general pattern. If you need heterogeneous lookup, the standard unordered map also does not have it. You can get it like this, build yourself a view type, or use one that's already available, have it as a view into one of the contained types, and then look up using the view types. So I have only three more minutes. <laughs> so um, I don't know, I'll just rush ahead. Hmm? Hmm? OK, then let's have questions. Does anyone have questions? One question, two questions. Yeah. All in the back, one second. <laughs> Uh, hi. Um, when we talked about the mid function, you said um, you reduced it to a one liner and you are doing assert in debug mode but not in release mode. Mm -hmm. um, 
that is nice if you have um, if you know all data that's coming in uh, during debug mode. But um, if you we are talking about real projects, you are having dynamic data data coming from a database, from the user, from the web, from everywhere. Um, how do you ensure that this does not crash then? Well, if you take a substring, why would you take a substring out of range in the first place? I mean. So the, so the comment was that I'm, uh, with this, I'm moving the responsibility to check the parameters to the caller. Yes, exactly, that's what I'm doing. That's where they belong. Because the caller knows. He knows whether he can assume this because he checked earlier and now calls 15 times mid, but he has checked that he has, uh, he has at least 15 characters. So I don't need to do this all over again. Or he knows what to check. In, in the case where, where the mid function itself checks, I get something returned. I, I don't get an error. I, it does not throw an exception or something. It doesn't give me a return value. It gives me a null Q string. This null Q string could have been the, what I asked for, the substring, or it can be an error condition. I cannot tell. So how does this help you? It does not. You need to check yourself before you call the function. And since you need to do this anyway, we don't need to repeat the check and return some nonsense from, from the QString mid function. Okay? Well, I yeah. think we are pretty much out of time now, so... Uh, one question, maybe? Uh, a very short one. So. Uh, I, I don't think I need the mic. I can repeat. I can repeat. Have you thought about uh, efficient handling of uh, regular expressions with uh, QString Woo? Yes. That would be really yes. interesting. Yes. I think. Um, there's some parts of the QREG apps API which has been enabled, matching basically, but uh, we cannot yet put um, a string view, uh, accept a string view as, a, as the regular expression itself. I would like to do that. And uh, I don't see a reason why this should not work because you're compiling this into some intermediate state anyway. But this compilation step is delayed at the moment and it does not happen on construction. So uh, we would need to store the string somewhere and that is um, still undecided how we go about this. But match pattern, uh, uh, you can match QString views, I believe. Pepper, you can match QString views with Q yeah, records. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Mark. Yeah. Uh, well. I'm sure you will be around for a while. Yeah. So if you have further questions on this topic, please feel free to stop by at, at the KDAP booth. I'm sure you will be available there.